line, number 155. Gears of spanning vanity and pride, carrying up a lover's crucified. No, not a was for me, he died. A Calvary, mercy, there was great grace, was free. Heart, and there was multiplied to me. Bear my burden, so my liberty. I was going down for the last time No one heard my cry My voice was swiftly fading Drifting with the tide When a hand from out of nowhere Gently slipped in mine And I thank God he found me Just in time just before the waves of slumber had rocked my soul to sleep just before the angry billows had pulled me out to deep god knows how long i drifted when i saw the old lifeline and i thank god he found me just in time well i don't remember drifting cause pleasure rode with me when careless winds start blowing you drift so easily and storms make no exception and friend i sure had mine and i thank god he found me just in time just before the waves of slumber had rocked my soul to sleep just before the angry billows had pulled me out to deep god knows how long i drifted when i saw the old lifeline and i thank god he found me 
just in time. God knows how long I drifted when I saw the old lifeline, and I thank God he found me just in time. George, if you'd come up and let these folks get a little athletics in them. She's come again.
Amen. All right. Coming down out of the north, out of the land of ice and snow. Brother Delaney, let's go. saved? I'll tell you what, here's the big part. Do you enjoy being saved? I mean, the good thing about having like church on a Saturday, church on a Friday, you're the first stringers. You know that? You guys are the first stringers. No, Everybody else sitting on the couch getting ready for uh, Super Bowl Sunday or something like that and, and waste their time and the worldly things uh, uh, around. You guys are here. You guys are in church. And, uh, and, and it's good to see. I, I I'm part of church planners, so I see all, a lot of my friends from church planners that are here. And, uh, and we got two churches plant. We got uh, Pastor uh, Legrecki. He's uh, he planted a church this year and uh, with the Lonskys. And uh, uh, Brother Craig and uh, Brother Dunbar, pastors, excuse me, they, uh, they've helped me out a lot, you know, coming up there. We had people saved when the church planners come up. They get saved because we hit those doors enough, and you get it out there, and you got to soften people up for one reason. they gotta, they, they got to get ready, you see, because the next guy comes up, and the next guy, next guy, next guy. And then finally the right guy comes up, and that guy gets saved. You see, that's why we preach the gospel, you know that? You know, uh, we preach the gospel for those reasons. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I'm like, I'm humbled to be here because uh, uh, my ministry basically pretty much started here. You don't even realize it. Nobody realized it. My ministry started here. Came through these doors one day, and uh, I didn't know what was going on in my life. I knew I was called to preach years ago and didn't want to do it. And God got a hold of me later on. And... Uh, I was at a church that was dead. I mean, when I say dead, I mean dead. It was dead. It was, you know, get the, get, bury the guy. Am I supposed to put this thing on? Okay. I never, I never, I'm going to forget everything. My wife still puts my clothes out. And everybody pretty much knows that. Now, how do I know if this thing's on? Red lights, that's on? So I'm on, huh? I'm like a dinosaur, man. I don't even know how to make do my computer. I just push the button, you know. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, it, like I said, it's uh, it started here, and what had happened was uh, I was in a dead church, and and I came here because this was like refuge to me. Bible believers are refuge. I like getting to a place where I can go, I can go talk about the Bible, and nobody gets upset. Yeah, you know, there's churches out there. You go in there, you, you bring up something. Oh, no, you can't talk about. Man, I want to talk about anything. Amen. You know, I don't care what it is. You know, what, what's the big deal? I mean, none of that stuff anyway is going to get anybody saved. You know, so we can talk about those things. And uh, so I came down here for refuge. And, uh, and I always come down. I used to come, I come down early. And I usually get, uh, I usually get, you know, in the beginning, I get humbled. Uh, Pastor Birkenshaw has always humbled me when I came in here. And I don't have a problem with that, you know. I'm kind of high on the, you know, I got a, a problem with it. So it's good to get pushed down, you know. And, uh, and that's a good thing. I don't mind that, you know. I don't mind that. My wife does it every day. So I can take it, you know. So, uh, so uh, you know, I, I, I was praying about it. And I said, Lord, what do you want out of my life. I, I can't do it anymore. I can't make my decisions. I need you to. And I've been, we were praying about it, my wife and I. We were actually going to, this is what we thought. That is a two and a half hour ride. We were going to drive all the way down here to go to church. Because this is the only, we felt this was all there was for Bible believers. And I was just sick and tired of uh, uh, dealing with debt. You know, with death in the church. So, uh, I was here to actually change churches too that day, and uh, all of a sudden, um, <laughs> Brother Overton, he turns around, he says to me, he says, you ever talk to Dewey Stewart? I said, well, I said right out, I said, that's a funny name. <laughs> Dewey Stewart, that's funny. <laughs> so I got to talk to, uh, he talked to me, and Dewey wasn't here that day, Pastor Stewart, uh, and I just blew it off. I said, ah, no big deal. I went back to that dead church and was cleaning the toilets in the place, and all of a sudden, a knock on the door comes upstairs. And uh, 
I got the door got open and all of a sudden uh, somebody says, uh, you better come up here. Somebody's up here to talk to you. I said, okay. So I come upstairs and I, I said, well, uh, who are you? He goes, I'm Dewey Stewart. <laughs> My heart left that day with that man. I became his servant. Now, that's a good thing. I became his servant. My wife will tell you that. See, I, everybody wants, I work for the Lord. I, no, if you're not the man of God, work for the pastor. That's the biggest problem in the church house today. Everybody thinks, I got my own mission. I got my own lifeboat. No, no, you work for the pastor first. If you can't serve a man, why aren't you going to serve God? How do you think you're going to serve God if you can't serve a man? You know? That's why I look towards women. They serve men. You know? And, and, uh, and, and people don't, don't understand that. If you can't serve a man, why do you, why you think you're going to serve God? We got a lot of men who don't want to serve anymore. They think, I serve God. No, you're going to serve somebody else first. You know, you ain't that good. <laughs> nobody's that good first. You know, nobody's that good. Everybody's got somebody to answer to anyway. Um, now, I was once I was at, uh, at Watertown, I became a servant. God opened the door. I came down forward. I went to pray. I said, Lord, whatever you want me to do, I'll do. I'll do anything. What you want me to do, I'll go to governor. I said that. I said, I'll go to governor if you want me to. All of a sudden, a hand touches my shoulder and says, I want you to pray about governor. I got up and said, I'll be going to governor. And I grabbed my I went to my wife. I said, we're going to governor. And she said, okay, let's go. We went up. Uh, so we went up there. The first track I handed out to talk to some guy. Some guy cussed me out. I said, this must be the place. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> so I went from there and, uh, you know, more tracks, more tracks out of line. And uh, a guy pulled up one day uh, from Alabama. And he said, well, I'm going to set a church up in Canton. Uh, he says, but what about here? I said, well, let's, let's try. And uh, really, he was up there to give me a nice boot in the butt because he knew something. He helped me out. His name's Kevin Buttram. He's a pastor now down in Alabama. Nice man. Beautiful man. I'd wash his feet in a second. And uh, it all started from there. Now, you know, my first services, uh, after he left, everybody thought the pastor left. My first services, I preached to my wife for two weeks. It's really tough when you had to preach about adultery. And your wife's the only one sitting there, you know? <laughs> and, then, uh, and then, you know, then next thing you know, uh, a person came in, that was Miss Yvonne, she came in. And why don't you people, Governor, why don't you stand up? Uh, I just want you people to know this. This is where your prayers went. These people that are right there, and I, I want to thank you for them. Um, uh, Brother Mark, he got saved just recently, uh, within a year. Also, uh, Miss Lori, she's what, just over a year, just over a year. But most of us are all new into the Bible-believing circles. All right. And that's where your prayers are. And they're worth it. Those people, they're yeah, worth it. Okay, so uh, uh, let's get down to the message. Uh, what do I got, three hours? Oh, 30, three hours and 30 minutes. So uh, I'll try and lengthen it out. My wife, she's got my folder, so we'll go for, uh, more, more on there. And uh, if you would, would you turn to uh, 2 Timothy uh, chapter 4 and then get Genesis chapter 1 in your hands? I'm going to start from uh, small to, to large kind of thing. I'm not uh, very uh, intelligent and, and all that stuff. I just go down the line. I just want to go with uh, one verse in here. And uh, you pretty much know you've been, this has been beat up, this verse. And it's in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7. It says, uh, Paul says, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have uh, kept the faith. Let's pray real fast. Lord, would you help me, Lord God? I uh, uh, came here with one message. I'm preaching another. And uh, thank you for that. You put that on my heart, Lord God. I thank you for these people coming. I thank you for the humbleness of this place, Lord God, that humbles me. I thank you, Lord God, for the preachers that are here, these, the preaching. It's, it, you've given a lot of liberty this morning, Lord God, and we thank you for it. And we thank you for the blood of Jesus Christ covering our sins. And helping us that we can have a liberty to enjoy our salvation that you've given us. Thank you, Lord. And, and please, Lord, help me. Have mercy on me. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, Paul gets in and he says, uh, I fought a good fight. 
And uh, I've, I've, I've finished my course. I kept the faith. And you go to every camp meeting. They were talking about it. Every single camp meeting you go to, somebody gets up and they preach this. Okay? And, uh, or they preach the armor of God. You know, uh, finally, brethren, uh, you know, uh, be strong in the Lord. And then they say, put on the whole armor of God. Well, I'm going to tell you something today, and I'm going to put it to you. All dressed up and nowhere to go. All it is is a pep rally. Standing on chairs and turning around and saying, okay, you just got this, you got this, you got that. Guy gets up, whoopity doo but he do. And all these kids come forward and have a crying fit. Yeah. Guess what? I'm going to give you a little rebuke right now. Your churches are turning charismatic. Yeah, yeah it's called crying fits. Amen. How many people are getting up here? You know, if you haven't been to the altar all weekend, you're right, right with God. Man, I came here to enjoy myself, not to have a crying fit. You know, that's what's happening in the church today. You're becoming charismatic. The people are coming in, and all they want to do is have a crying fit up at the top. The kids leave, and they're worse than they... You made that child a two-fold child of hell, man. Amen. Because he thinks that's Christianity. Right. He can go out and do everything he wants, and next week he can put on a crying fit, or the camp meeting comes. Amen. That's Amen. not... Man, that's not soldiering. Amen. That's not fighting. You guys, be a man. First off, you've got to figure out who you want to serve. Do you realize that? You've got to figure out who you're going to serve. Okay, let's go to Genesis chapter 1. Now watch Genesis chapter 1. It says, in the beginning God created. Now look down to verse 3 and it says, and God said. Verse 4, and God saw. And 5, and God called. 6, and God said. 7, and God made. Eight, and God called. Nine, and God said. Ten, and God called. Eleven, and God said. And then he says, right in twelve, he says, and God saw. And uh, we go over again, and it says in, um, in sixteen, and God made. In seventeen, and God set. I know you're going, you're rambling, preach. Okay, okay, just keep, stay with me. Eighteen, he says, uh, at the end, he says, and God saw again. Okay? Now, uh, looked at it 20, it says, and God said. And, uh, and 21, and God uh, created, and at the bottom of it, and God saw. 22, and God blessed. 24, and God said, and 25, and God made, and 26, and God said a lot of stuff. God did this, and God did that, and, and we jump up and down, and we're no longer atheists. Whippity do. Okay, we're good on that, right? Now go over to chapter 2. Understand, God said, God did, God this. Okay? Great God. Look at chapter 2, and it says, down to verse uh, 3, it says, um, it says and, uh, the, on the seventh day, God ended his work. Okay, and then on uh, verse number three, it said, that God blessed again all that God which God created." Now I want you to see something in chapter four, and there's a changeover. Look at chapter four, and it turns around. It says uh, at the end, it says, "And the Lord God." Uh, excuse me, in verse number four, in verse number four of chapter number two, it says, "It says, and at the very end, it says that the Lord God made." And five, it says. Uh, for the Lord God. And in 7 it says, and the Lord God. And guess so you know, that is all the way throughout the second chapter. It says God in the first chapter. It says Lord God in the uh, second chapter. Now uh, let's go over to third chapter. And it says, and now the serpent was more subtle uh, than any beast uh, of the field uh, which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath who said? What happened to the Lord God? You understand? What I'm trying to say to you today, after this point, the Lord God was out of it. God said this and God said that again. you got to choose who you want to serve. Do you want them to be just God or you want them to be Lord? you got to realize that. You realize that after this chapter, Lord God doesn't show up until Noah... And then it doesn't show up again after that until Abraham. It's Lord God. How about you? Are you just saying God? Are you saying Jesus? Or are you saying Lord? Amen. Which one you serve? You've got to do that individually. 
You got to understand that. Now, I got a lot of years in the military. And uh, I've, I've done, I've set divisions and I've done, dealt with core level stuff. I've dealt with battalions. I was a senior officer. It was fine when he said he was talking about being an officer. In uh, May 13th, 1989, I was commissioned a second lieutenant in the United States Army. And uh, one of the reasons I've, I'm, I'm preaching this right now is because I've heard them preach the armor of God and got them all suited up and nowhere to go. Do you know one of the biggest problems with Christianity is you don't understand the mission. You don't understand the mission and you don't know how to use the weapons then. Okay? You say, what's the mission? Well, I'll give you the mission that they called the commission. It's actually the mission. You got to understand the mission statement. There's a reason why we do all these things. I'll, I'll give you, for instance, um, if somebody was to say to me, I want you to defend. We're in defensive mode. Then they turn around the op order and they said, I want you to defend Hill 109 against the Red Army in order to, pe to, to, to stop penetration of phase line alpha. Well, you'd say, well, the mission is we're in the defense and uh, we're going to stay in the defense and we're going to fight. That's not the mission. The mission and the most important thing was in order to stop penetration of phase line al uh, alpha. The reason why is because you could defend right there, but in the end, if you have to go on the offense, that's the best defense there is. You do whatever you do, set up obstacles. You set everything up to stop penetration of phase line alpha. That's the most important thing. People, you forgot the most important thing. Go to Matthew chapter 28. All that equipment is great for an individual soldier. All dressed up, nowhere to go. All dressed up, nowhere to go. And you know where I'm going. Go down to verse 19. He turns around and Jesus says this to him. He says, uh, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. You know what that is? That's called the commander's intent. Am I not right, Brother Malcolm? That is the commander's intent right there. That is not the most important thing. This is what you're going to do in order to do something else. The in order to is in the next, the next book. Go to Matthew chapter, uh, Mark chapter 16. In Mark chapter 16, in verse 15, how easy is that? He says, he says, and he said unto them, go ye into all the world and do what? Preach the gospel to every creature. There's the most important thing. Is, look, I'm going to, we're going to train people. We are going to teach them. We are going to baptize them. We are going to get themselves on a walking right path in order that we can preach the gospel to every creature. The most important thing at the end is that the gospel gets preached to every creature. See, we're forgetting all that. See, what we're doing is, is we're getting people, we think we're getting them saved, uh, save, 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 and it's called save to serve. And uh, let's get out there and serve, 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 and push, 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 and not teach, and not baptize, and not get their life right a little more. They don't even know how to love God first, and next thing you know, you got them banging doors. And they're going up there with all the wrong intentions. Do you realize that Noah, if you learn your lessons from Noah, Noah had to learn how to worship first. And then God said that, that to those who diligently seek him, he had to get his walk right. And then he built the ark. They're the things you've got to do first. You see, that's why God said, these are the things I want you to do. And then he turns around and he says, I'm going to give you equipment. 
And believe me, that equipment is awesome. You can't, I mean, come on. What, everybody says, well, you got to threaten me with heaven? I mean, you got this open door policy going on. I mean, in the military, the open door policy is I can go in and talk to the commander, okay? One on face to face if I go through my chain of command, okay? Now, you've got the open door policy at all times. You go in and talk to the commander when you want. Now, the problem is not the open door. The problem is you getting in there to talk to the commander. That's the biggest problem. The biggest problem is we've lost the prayer life. We've lost the prayer life. The problem is you get down in the morning and you're yawning. And you need a cup of coffee. Know why? You're not excited when you got up to talk to God. You're more excited to talk to somebody down the road. I, you know, uh, uh, Pastor Caesar's there. He's a real intelligent man. I heard him preach on good preaching. I'm going to see him. And you get up in the morning and don't say, man, I'm ready to speak to God. You never get up with that fervency anymore. First, you've got to understand something. Whom do you serve? Is he your Lord? If he's your Lord, then you'll want to Love on him and praise on him and walk with him. And then you want to be a soldier, you got to understand the mission. You got to understand the mission. Now, most of the time, and anybody tell you, a second lieutenant in the army, what he does is he's uh, brand new and he comes in and they give an op order. Okay? Usually they start out no different than God. God, God starts you out small, uh, a small amount of, he, he, he got to build up your faith, you see. On small things. That's why they were standing back at the River Jordan ready to go over. God was show, going to show them, open it up, and, and, and get their faith back in before they go in and fight. you got to build up your faith before you fight, you see. So, and you got to let God do that. You can't do that. you got to let God do that, okay? So, um, the first thing, uh, once you get the, the mission, that second lieutenant comes back, and he's got 60, 60 books in his hand like this, and he, he's trying to build an op order, this huge monster. He starts doing all this, and then all of a sudden, this well-experienced uh, 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 tech sergeant or whatever sergeant, LaGrecki, comes in and says, Sir, you've wasted a half hour. Can I see what's there? He looks over and he goes, Oh, we just need this part right here. And he walks back and he says, this is what applies to us. And this is how it's done. This is what you forgot in the book. This is what you forgot in the book. Okay? You're so worried about if you're smarter knowing a gap or this gap or that gap. I mean, or Daniel's 70th week or this thing or that thing. And I'm going to show myself out good and you can't win the soul to Christ. You know, that ain't going to help you win nothing. You got to love God first. You got to be able to walk with him first. And then you can do the work. Okay? And then you got to understand who you're going to serve. And then you got to realize that individual. And then you got all the uniform that's on. And then you got to realize how you're going to apply it. You know how you apply it? Rightly dividing that word of truth. You know how you rightly divide it? You got your, uh, the Bible says, go to, go to uh, uh, Ephesians chapter 2. He says he first deals with the individual in the first part of the chapter. And he says, uh, and you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sin, wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, uh, the spirit that now worketh in the children of, of disobedience. That was your, your boss. That was your lieutenant back then. Among whom also we all had our conversations in time past, in our past, uh, in the lust of, the, of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and where by nature the... Uh, by nature, the children of wrath, even as others. That was you. And look at the next part. He says, but God. Amen. That's you now. But because of God, but because of what Jesus Christ did and his great love, he loved us first. Wherewith he, he loved us. 
Okay, and he quickened us uh, who were dead in trespasses and sins. Okay, now, that in ages to come, look at seven. In 7 it says that in ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. And of course, the for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. Now, we're going to go back down a little for, and it says uh, in 11, it says, Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called the uncircumcision by uh, that by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made, made by hands, that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Thirteen, but now, where are you getting to, preacher? Who is your apostle? Paul. Do you know that the part of the op order that actually directly applies to you and is, is there is Paul's epistles? If you would spend more time dealing with Paul's epistles, you'd learn how to soldier right. That is what applies to you. Look, I didn't tell you don't go to the whole counsel of God. I did not say don't read the whole Bible. I didn't say don't read this, don't read. Look, you got your doctrine from who? You got your doctrine from Paul. You got your doctrine from Paul. Okay, these are the things that apply for you. These are the things that are going to help you to do what? To build a workable ministry. You see, you got to understand something. In, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, he said, we have this ministry. We're a team. We are a team developing something and building something. And the way we build it is to be on that same team. You may have a leader. But that preacher is also a sheep, and he's in that ministry. Like I'm telling you, I said, first, you've got you to, as an individual, you've got to figure out who you're going to serve, and you're going to, make Christ, you're going to make Christ your Lord. Look, you come down here all day and get saved, but you've got to get up sometime or another and say, is he my Lord? Am I going to do what he says to do? And that's an individual thing. Now, all of a sudden, you're in, and you've got to understand something else. You've got to understand the mission statement. The most important thing is you're going to preach the gospel to every creature. And then God's put a big op order together. And he breaks it down to little things in here. I mean, I'm talking small stuff is in here. Uh, support. I mean, uh, we have uh, adjacent units that are out there. I mean, do you realize that everybody in here, every pastor, and I'm a, a pastor of church, we are adjacent units working together for a common thing. What's that? The fight. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. That's the common fight. Okay? That's what we're talking about. Principalities and powers of the air. That's the enemy situation that's going on outside. Our weapons are not carnal, but they're spiritual. We know all this stuff. Look, you don't need a guy to get up here and start doing the pep rally. Ask him, all dressed up to fight. Where do we go? How do I use this stuff? Okay? How you use that stuff is start, start listening to what Paul said in here. You know, start, start, start listening to the apostle that was placed there to bring that gospel to you. Start seeing how he set it up. Amen. And also, I'm going to tell you, get advice and counsel because God said counsel's good. When I, I can tell you, I go to guys, I go to guys like, uh, like Pastor Craig and Pastor Dunbar and I ask him, what about this? You know, my first year in the ministry, this is, I actually tried to apply being a pastor to being a commander. But I did it the wrong way. I'll tell you how I did it. I thought that I would get up here and I would say and they would do. Okay? And when I told them what to do, they would do it. Okay? But, but through this, I was preaching to my wife. Amen. You know? But you know what? Then the building block started from there. The building block started from there at that time. And a lot of you have been gracious to us through God, who's been merciful to us. You know what the biggest thing I've learned in three years is the word mercy. I mean, God, God put so much mercy. You, you figure out, God says in, uh, in, in chapter 5 of Matthew, I think it's verse 7, he says, uh, Blessed are the merciful, uh, for they shall obtain mercy. 
And I understand where doctrinally sits, but I'll tell you what, take that verse and listen to it. Because you look at somebody like David, who David, he did all those things, but God was merciful to David. And there's a reason. You know why? Because David was merciful. Merciful to Saul when he found him in, in, that, in the cave in Engedi. He was merciful uh, to Saul again when he saw him. He was merciful to Abigail. David always had mer Mephibosheth. Mercy, mercy, mercy. Then when David gets hit, God says, I'll be merciful to you. What about a guy named Paul? Paul turns around and he's, uh, he's killing Christians. And, uh, and God comes in and he saves Paul. You know why I say Paul? He knew that Paul would be merciful. That's where you, all, the, all you hear from Paul is mercy, mercy, mercy. I have mercy, mercy, mercy. He knew that Paul would be merciful. And Paul was. Do you realize that the preaching of the gospel is mercy? Where do you get that, preacher? Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter uh, 4. I'm going to end it after this. He says, uh, therefore, seeing we have this ministry. Remember, I just put that up. As we have received what? Mercy. We faint not. But have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them that believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine Unto them, it's mercy. God's mercy is shown through that gospel. Are you out to put mercy out? I mean, with, even without a cup of coffee in the morning and you're driving to work, are you merciful? I mean, somebody gets in front of you that's going 20 miles per hour in front of you, merciful? You know? I mean, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Are you merciful? That's a good one. That's good. Mercy and long-suffering. You want to plant a church? Learn that. Two words. Mercy, long-suffering. You're going to deal with it for about, I don't know, maybe about 20, 30 years. Mercy and long When somebody gets, you know, we're all merciful to our, to our boss at work because he has a paycheck in his hand to give us. But all of a sudden, somebody does something in the church. Man, we're going to stand up against that person. No mercy whatsoever to that person over there that's just a little bit screwed up. Let's smack the NIV out of their hand when they just walk through the door. You know? They didn't even get grounded. Let's put them in their place. She came in here wearing a skirt. I saw that. Mercy. Long-suffering. What happened? What happened with that? I'm just going to end it right there, Pastor, if you would. It's good to be saved. It's good to be saved. Sometimes can this all right? Come on. Amen. Would you like to do a piano solo for us afterwards? I'd like you to. Your song. Your song. Yes, whatever you want. Stormy wind that blows 
faithful playing music uh, in a very small church uh, you don't know how valuable your Christian members are to you lose a lot and this lady has been a blessing to my soul uh, with my son and, uh, well this whole fellowship is being put on by three families and two of them are this is it Little is much when God is in. friend of mine, Brother Caesar, is going to come forward. He's going to teach. 
He's more apt at teaching than preaching. Feel perfectly comfortable. I want you to teach. That's what you're comfortable with. Give us the book. Okay? For me, I don't care if it's preaching or teaching as long as it's the book. I don't care if it's topical or, um, help me out, expository, as long as it's the book. And you come on up and give it to us, brother. Can give a practical message if you like or I can give one that we've been going through at our church just trying to figure out the difference between the soul and the spirit but there's been so much practical stuff today I can give you a practical message on, on spiritual warfare which seems to get missed sometimes any thoughts As Lord leads, brother. all right then maybe we'll, we'll look at the, uh, some of the uh, spiritual warfare because as uh, so many of the messages have been today, they've been uh, very practical. And, uh, you know, we know the passage in, in Ephesians cha chapter 6. And, of course, uh, we're given the admonition to put on uh, the armor of God uh, that we may uh, war a good warfare. And I'll just read the verses because they're beautiful. <laughs> so... The, the, I find the Bible to be the, the greatest written book of all time, in my observation. And so he says in uh, verse 10, he says, Finally, my brethren, uh, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints and for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. A beautiful passage. And, uh, you know, we're in a, a spiritual battle uh, the Lord has so constructed the universe that the first thing he did was he made the heaven that's spiritual. And then he made the earth that's physical. And, you know, by nature, we as carnal beings, we look at everything through the physical eyes. And he, he says, I want you to understand what's physical is just shadows of the real. The real is the spiritual. The substance is the spiritual. This is a shadow. This is a, a vaporous shadow land that we live in. One day when we're delivered from it and, and we're finally in a spiritual body in heaven, we're going to look back and go, how did we live in this place? Uh, uh, a long, long time ago, there was a guy that wrote a book uh, called Flatland. It was written out of England, and it was at the time when uh, people were beginning to get the notion that uh, it's four dimensions, Einstein with the fourth dimension. He, he mistakenly tried to uh, merge time with uh, the three dimensions of length and width and height. Okay, and they said, we'll stick the fourth dimension at time. And now he was wrong. Einstein was wrong. He was wrong because he didn't read a Bible. And, and, and what he wanted to do was he wanted to start a theory called relativity. And, and what he wanted to do was not believe, like God said, there's absolute time and there's an absolute place where you are in time. And he wanted all time to be relative. He wanted everything to be relative. I guess he was 
to, to Einstein, everything was a relative thing, you know. And of course, you hear this all the time. Are, are you happy? Well, happiness is relative. I make a little money and my relatives are happy, you know, and it's that kind of stuff. And, and um, so Einstein was into this relativity, but, but his, his error was not understanding. See, God, uh, there's a spiritual realm which is far superior to this one. And when they wrote, wrote this book, The Flatland, what the guy did, he said, I, how can I make people think in four dimensions because they're used to three? I got an idea. Let's pretend there's a world called Flatland. And in Flatland, there's only two dimensions. There's length and width, but there's no height. And, and the creatures in Flatland are like, uh, some are like a little circle, some are a square, some are a triangle, some are a polygon, and they just move around the Flatland. And of course, they can't go over each other, they have to go around one another. Now let's pretend a three-dimensional being wanted to enter Flatland. So, so we take a sphere, a ball, and now it's passing into Flatland. Well, when it first hits it, it's a point. Then as the ball continues to pass through, it becomes an ever-expanding circle. And then as it's getting, leaving Flatland, it becomes a smaller, smaller circle till it's a point and it disappears. And all the creatures in Flatland, and what was that all about? I mean, what, what's this bizarre thing? Because they don't understand the third dimension. Well, what God's saying to us is we're, we're basically living in Flatland. This is a shadow what we're in. The reality, it'd be like God moving through our land. We don't quite understand him because he's so great. And the battles that go on are spiritual. And we as flatland creatures, we don't get it. And so he's trying to prepare us for a spiritual battle here. Now, now the curious thing is the spiritual battle is fought on two fronts. And if you go back in the Old Testament, there's a passage uh, one day in the book of Samuel where uh, David sends his men, Joab and uh, Ab, his brother, Abiathar, that may be his name, and they're out and there's this battle, and there's the battle before and behind. And they had to divide into two groups and fight the battle on two fronts. The spiritual battle that you are and I are in is, is a two-front battle. And I think part of the problem is we get so interested in one front, we miss the other front of the battle. Okay. Now, the, the first front of the battle is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Paul wound up with the final front of the battle in verse 19, but what he wanted us to understand is there's, a, there's an initial front. There's some spiritual wickedness in high places. And, and Paul, writing to the church at Corinth, says in verse 3, For though we walk in the flesh, I mean, okay, I'm born again. I have a soul that's been sealed with the Holy Spirit. And if I'm a good boy, I get filled with the Holy Spirit. You can be sealed without being filled. The moment you're saved, you're sealed. Now, whether you're filled, that's going to be a personal choice that you've got to make in order to come to the well daily and let God fill you with that Holy Spirit. But, but you're in the flesh. Naturally, that's what we're in. I'm in this corruptible body, but my soul and my spirit are inside. And what I need to do is remember, I'm not warring after the flesh. So here's the problem. See, the weapons of our warfare, they're not carnal, they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. The first battle is inside. It's, it's in our own mind. It's the battle we war inside. There's an inner war that goes on every single day in our own mind. Before I ever get out there and fight the enemy in the world, before I ever get out there and try and win someone to Christ, I've got I to gotta work on the inside with this inner battle. This battle rages daily. This is, these are the imaginations and the, the imagination. You know, the first time that word is ever found in the Bible is in Genesis 6 and verse 5. It's one of my life verses. <laughs> I'll read it for you. I have two life verses. This is the first one, and it reads like this. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Remember when I was young in Bible study going, oh my goodness, he just pegged me. All of a sudden I realized that the imaginations in my mind and the thoughts in my heart 
tended toward darkness and evil. That was a great revelation for me because I began to look in the mirror and I saw the enemy is me. Now, now look, I appreciate that, that as Christians we fight you know, the world, the flesh, and the devil, but the greatest of those three is the flesh. It's me. It's me. Even if the devil were gone, it'd still be a losing battle. How do I know? Read what happens in Revelation 20. <laughs> if I remember, they, they seal that guy <laughs> for a thousand years. It says they shut him up. I like that. They shut him up. He can't talk for a thousand years. Can't deceive anybody. He's shut up in that pit. But what happens at the end? When he gets out, a whole bunch of people follow him all over again. Why? What was wrong? The flesh. That's God's seventh experiment that he's running, you know, like a master chemist. Okay, let's see, we tried it in a garden, then we tried it with a conscience, and we tried it with government, then we tried it with promises, then we tried it with the Mosaic Law. We're trying it now with grace. I'm going to run the last one. I'm going to run it this way. I'm going to have my son running planet Earth. The world is going to be good because my son's running it. The government's going to be good because my son's running it. The teaching they get in the public schools will be good because my son runs the public schools. And the only problem I got, and the devil shut up, the only problem I got is the flesh, and guess what happens? The thing goes sour. Because a corrupt tree can't bring forth good fruit. Even then, they'll need to be born again. Just being born into the millennium will not be sufficient. They'll need the new birth. Well, we've got the new birth. What's our problem? It's the imagination. It's the things that we think naturally. You see, our go to Psalm 94 and look at verse 11. Psalm 94, verse 11. The Lord knoweth the thoughts of man, that they are their vanity. They're, they tend to be empty. They tend to be worthless. They're not profitable. They are vain. Those are the thoughts that we have on our own. And, and the imagination, the problem that we have is if we think with our own natural mind, and, and by the way, that's the natural carnal mind. When, when we talk to someone about the gospel, they're in a natural mind. We're, we're in a different mind. I, I liken it to um, years ago when I was a kid uh, going to public school, they used to play the World Series during the afternoon. And I wanted to listen. So one of my buddies got a transistor radio and snuck it into the back. <laughs> and so here we are in the back of, of uh, a science class, and we're listening to the World Series on transistor radio. Now, back then, transistor radio was simple. It was just AM. That's all it had. You know, about 550 on the AM dial to about 1600 on the AM dial. You find the right thing. That's it. This was in the early 60s. Later on, they developed FM. And FM is a completely different wavelength. It's a richer, more melodious. It's much better for music. AM is better for talk. And once FM came around, all the AM stations died up and everything went to FM for music. It's like the difference between the natural man on the AM and you and I on the spiritual level. We're on the FM. They don't hear what we're saying sometimes. They have great difficulty understanding. We're speaking in a language they don't quite understand. That's why it is so important that we have sound doctrine. And sound doctrine doesn't mean that we have all the right words and we can rightly divide the Bible, although that's all good. Sound doctrine means we live in a manner that is, uh, in has integrity and character before them. Only Christianity has sound doctrine with a lifestyle that's so different than any other thing that calls itself a religion, that they know the difference. Yeah. If, if a Muslim does something crazy, yeah, he's just a Muslim. If a Buddhist does something crazy, just a Buddhist. But if a Christian does something crazy, but you're a Christian, they know the difference. They, they know deep in their heart there should be a difference between Christian and anyone else because they know Christ is supreme. They know he's supreme because that's the name that they take in vain. I've never heard them take Muhammad's name in vain or Allah's name in vain or any other. Why? Because God says they'll take my name in vain. And deep down they know the name of Christ. And they expect more out of a Christian. Sound doctrine means you live in such a way where they'll know there's a difference. 
And so, so sometimes we can't quite communicate with them, but they can see. They may not be able to hear initially, but they can see the difference that Christ has made in your life. But you've got to fight this battle with your own imagination. We need to purge the imaginations inside of us that make us think wrong of God. You know, Paul said one place, the goodness of God leadeth to repentance. The goodness of God. The gospel is good news. Sometimes, I mean, when I'm on the street, sometimes I get tempted when I see the things that pass before me in the summer and the way they're dressed and the marks on them and, and the piercings and everything. You, you want to start preaching against sin, but he didn't say preaching against sin leads to repentance. He said preaching the goodness of God leads to repentance. Amen. They need to hear about the glory of God. Our God is good. Our God is great. They have been lied to about God in the public schools. God is maligned. He's belittled. He's denied. He's mocked. And we need to lift him up with the preaching of the goodness of God. Our imaginations are vain against God. God's given us his word that we can lift him up and tell the truth about him. This is the truth about God right here. Guess who knows it? You and I do. Guess what we need to do? We need to lift it up before these folks. We need to purge our imaginations. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 1. That part of the battle is getting our thoughts right. The church is the pillar and the ground of truth. So, so, so when we as pastors hold a church service, what, what is the job we want to do? We want to build the faith of those before us on the, on the good ground of truth, not the cursed ground that God did after Cain and, and, and Adam and, and Eve fell and he cursed that ground. We want the good ground. The, God, the ground that God built Adam out of was ground that had water in it. It had the water of the word. We need to build people up with the word of God when they're in a church service. I, I tell my folks, I say, look, you, you can bring a lost person to church if you want, but my aim isn't to get that person saved in church. My aim is to feed the flock. You love me? Feed the flock. Do you love me? Feed them. Now, I like to get them saved out there. So, so I, 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 I beg with the folks in, in the audience. I say, listen, don't twist someone's arm to come to this church. Invite them. If they say yes, then God's working and drawing. But if they say no, forget about it. Because I'm not going to try and win them in church. I'm going to teach you so you can go out there and do it. I need to build you and the, and the pillar and the ground of truth right here in the local church. I need to purge the imaginations of your mind. I need to help prepare you for the battle. What good would it be to have an army of people that are out of shape? Right. That's right. They can't do three push-ups. They can't run from here to the door. They can't peel an orange without breaking a sweat. I mean, what good would it, would it, what good would it do to have an army of people like that? This is the Lord's army. We've got to build them up on the faith. We must build them up on their most precious faith. That's what we're trying to do when we have them here with us. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1. So, so I'm purging their imagination. And I'll catch up with you in a minute. And we're going to look at uh, verse 19 uh, when we get there. Look at verse 18 just to get a running start. This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou mightest by them. These are the prophecies written by the prophets. This is the stuff all the way back from Moses. And by the way, the law will be helpful to you in your thinking. That's why God gave it. He's not going to abandon it when he comes back in the millennium. Jesus is going to be teaching the law. He's going to raise up Zadok the priest and they're going to reinstitute the laws again. The law doesn't get you saved, but the law was given to a people after they were saved. They got saved in Exodus 12, and when they were delivered, they got the law in Exodus 19 and 20. Okay, and so, so, so these prophecies, all these things, that, that by them thou mightest war a good warfare. We're in a, this is the good faith, this is a good battle, this is a good fight. Holding faith and a good conscience, which some, having put away concerning faith, have made shipwreck. What did they put away concerning faith? They put away their conscience. One of the things the Lord does with us by purging our imaginations through the church services is he keeps our conscience tuned up 
and sharp. See, see, what we tend, what, what, what a Gentile, what a, a, a lost person does is he defiles his conscience so it doesn't work anymore. Again, God does pictures. Look at the human body. Human body has a couple of very important systems inside of it. One of which is the brain. The other is the heart and the lung axis. And then the other is the nervous system. The nervous system allows you to interact with the world. You can taste things, you can feel things, and, uh, and sometimes you think you don't want a nervous system because if it wasn't for the nervous system, I wouldn't feel pain. But pain is important. Yeah. I had an uncle, he was injured and uh, it damaged one side of his body where he could no longer feel pain. And uh, we were doing some work once at the car wash and there was a hot motor and he was leaning against it without realizing it on the side of his body that couldn't feel pain and searing and burning his flesh until we got him away and took him to the hospital. Now listen, in, this is your human body. You've got a brain, you've got a heart-lung system, you've got a nervous system. In the soul... The brain is the mind. That's why what God wants to do is renew your mind through the word. The, the heart-lung system is the spirit. Uh, a natural man has a, a heart-lung system that is heart failure and it's ready for death. And what it needs is a transplantation. And it needs God's spirit put in there. And the nervous system is your conscience. That's how you're able to sense things spiritually, just like your nervous system senses things physically. And what you need to do is keep a good conscience. And the only way you're going to tune that thing up, again, is by spending time in the Word according to the prophecies that were written before us. That's why it's so important, we as pastors, we're, we're bringing people in and we're teaching them the Word of God. And I know, I know you do it. I know how important it is. Uh, yes, we do topical teaching. Yes, you do some textual teaching. You take a text, you take a fit. But very importantly, you want to take a, a book of the Bible and go through it because God lays a meal out better than we ever could. And as we just go through a passage of Scripture and let God minister to people. I remember when I was thinking of being a pastor in the late 90s, thinking, I watch these guys, I can't do this, Lord, I can't come up with these messages. He said, just read through my book. I'll give them the messages. Amen. Read and teach it. I'll give them to you and you just give it out. And I give these things out chapter by chapter and it, and it makes an effect on the folks that are in there as God tunes their conscience up, God purges their imaginations. Uh, herein do I exercise myself to always have a conscience void of offense toward God and men. How will I do that? Only according to his word. I'm going to do it any other way. Conscience follows the mind. Titus chapter 1, verse 15. That's why God wants this word to be put in. And, and, uh, and I know uh, we're the men that when we put this book in, we tell our people with assuredness, this is the word of God. Not the originals. This is the word of God. There's only one God of the Bible, and there's only one Bible of God. I don't know what language you speak, but God's been faithful. You speak uh, Spanish, it's the Reign of Valera, 1868. You speak uh, Italian, it's the Diodati. You speak uh, German, it's the Lutheran. You speak English, it's the King James Bible with the word of a king. That's God's book. And you've got to get them to believe that it'll effectually work when they believe it. When they don't believe it, it won't work. That's why when you go to these churches where they're carrying things around, they don't believe. You don't see any effect in them. They don't believe it. Right. Titus chapter 1, uh, uh, verse uh, 15. Unto the pure, all things are pure. But to them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. Even their mind and conscience is defiled. Notice how the mind is connected to the conscience. The conscience gets its tuned up. It's tuned up by what it hears. Why are the consciences of kids in public schools destroyed? Well, what are they learning there? Amen. What are they taught? They're taught everything goes. They're, they're taught that it's all right to, to have relationships with a member of the opposite sex or maybe the same sex. And their conscience is defiled by what's put into their mind. 
And so, so the, 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 the school system is, uh, depending on which way you view it, it's either a great success or a great failure. From Satan's standpoint, it's a great success. From God's standpoint, it's a great failure. Now, may, God, may Satan look at our church and say, that's a great failure. And may God look at it and say it's a great success. And that's why the first battle is the inward one. It's tuning ourselves up, getting our conscience right, getting our mind right, getting the imaginations pushed away. It's, it's literally doing the spiritual push-ups and chin-ups and sit-ups and, and laps so that we're ready to face that second battle in spiritual warfare. And that's the outward one. 1 Timothy 1.18, 1 Timothy 6.12. That's against the foes of the faith. That, those are the bad, go, I'll go back to 1 Timothy. We'll take a look at 1 Timothy chapter 1. And we saw it before. This charge, verse 18, I commit unto thee, my son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went on before thee, that thou mightest by them war uh, a good warfare. And uh, Paul said later on, he, he says in the 6th chapter, and in verse 12, to fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life whereunto thou art also called, and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. We have a faith that is meant to be spoken. It is not meant to be silent. I know that they teach people, well, your faith, it's a private thing. It's, it's to yourself. Uh, Paul told the church at Corinth, who was kind of a baby church with that idea, in the second book of Corinthians, uh, chapter 4 and verse 13, uh, according as it is written, I believed and therefore have I spoken. We also believe and therefore we speak. Biblical faith is meant to be spoken. Amen. Now the first part of the faith we want to tell them is the true God. I tell them how good he is. Tell them, tell them what he's done in your life. I hope he's done something in your life. I mean, that's what you're witnessing. You're witnessing that God wants to have a, a relationship with an individual, and you can show them firsthand because he's done it with me, and I'm no, no special. God's no respecter of persons. God will do the same with you. And you talk about the good things God's done in your life. Talk about the blessings that he's brought to your life, the truth that he's brought to your life. And this is the outward battle where we're preaching the gospel to every creature. We're preaching good news to people. We're not preaching judgment to people. Now, now look, I do understand. Uh, the truth is you want them to understand God does judge, but that's his left hand. He always leads with the right hand of compassion and mercy and righteousness. He's looking to make friends. He told people, if you want to make friends, you've got to show yourself friendly. I think he obeys what he writes. Yeah. Yeah. He's trying to make friends with people, not enemies with people. Now, if they slap his hand away a number of times, then eventually they'll face the left hand of judgment. Because the false balance, I'm telling the truth, that's an abomination to the Lord. He's well balanced. But he wants to lead with this. He wants to lead with his goodness. We have good news for the world. I don't know that the newspaper does. I don't know that the TV does. I don't know that the school books do. But we do right here. That's the good news. And so, so this spiritual warfare battle, the first front is the inward front against uh, our own imagination. The inward one of protecting and purifying and strengthening our conscience. And then the outer one is now we go out to proclaim and contend for the faith once delivered to the saints. And it's a good faith. And I think that's 30 minutes. So we're done. Amen. Thank you, brother. Dan, could you stand up for a minute? Dan is my bookkeeper, okay? Now, thank you, brother. I want every preacher that preached today to see him. Give him your name and your address, okay? This is my tradition here with my winter revival. I combine the fellowship meeting with my winter revival. I do it so that my people can have a meet a fellowship meeting.
people, um, fellowship meetings, we usually have them on Tuesday, middle of the week, then our people can't ever go to them. Yet. And I understand that, and that's fine. So I've, over the years, my tradition is to combine the two of them. And I take up a love offering every time. Now, if I have a fellowship meeting, I also, a lot of times I have a fellowship meeting here, then I don't do what I'm doing today. I just want you to know this. When I take up a love offering, I'm going to send a $50 check to everybody that preached this morning. It's not much. It's a token of gratuity. And give me for your gas. And then I have preachers that are preaching, and I've got to give them love offering. Because we're going tonight. And we went last night, and we went Thursday night. And this year, we actually started out on Wednesday. I'm just letting you know that this is a little bit different because this is what I've done over the years, just so you understand. So if you would, I need a couple uh, men in my church to get the offering plates. I don't know if Josh went down to help. So. Josh has to go to work. Huh? Josh has to go to work. Oh, I gotta go to work? Okay. We'll take up a love offering. It's for the preachers. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day. I pray that you bless this offering and uh, bless everybody here. And, uh, I thank you for this day. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. The Bible said, God love a cheerful giver, and all God's people said, Hoorah! say grace and I'd like to invite you to all come down and have a wonderful Italian feast I thank you all for coming I personally believe the spirit of the Lord was here today and blessed tremendously I hope you had your cup full I want to say this because I don't know who's here today I don't know who's saved and who's lost it's a very important thing if you've never been born again spiritually the brother was teaching us spiritually you must be born again I know this is going to maybe hurt your feelings. I'm not trying to hurt your feelings. Without a new birth, you're going to go to hell. I don't care how good of a life you lived, it wasn't good enough. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. For there is none righteous, no, not one. Yeah, every sinner must be born again. You have to come to a point in your life when you realize before God your goodness wasn't good enough. God's goodness is what will save you, for it's the goodness of God that leads repentance. God is so good that he'll forgive your past sins, your present sins, and your future sins. If you will be honest with him and simply ask him from the throne of your soul, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. If you will say, God, I wasn't what you wanted me to be, I wasn't what I should be in all my life, I have sinned against you. Please forgive me. Have mercy on this poor soul. God is good enough to send his son to this world to go to a cross and receive a beating and a whipping and a spearing and a hurting and suffering the wages of sin, yet without sin, to shed his blood so that you could have forgiveness of your sins through his sacrifice on Calvary's cross. That's how deep and true and good God's love is to us. And I wouldn't want anybody to leave here today and go to hell because God doesn't want anybody to go to hell. When people go to hell, they go to hell because they're too proud to humble themselves 
before the most gracious, benevolent God of creation that made all that you see and is going to fill eternity with a world without end in goodness and grace. So I hope if you have anything in your heart, well, I'm not sure I'm saved. See me, see Pastor, see any of the preachers that preached, Brother Dunbar, any of the preachers that preached, and just say, what was he talking about? I'm missing something. I, I've never been born again. And they'll show you and take the Bible, show you how you get saved. Now for the rest of you, we'll say grace and come on down and let's have some warm fellowship and some great food and enjoy the rest of the day and we'll see you back tonight at seven to nine we're going to have two more messages um two preachers you haven't heard yet heavenly father we thank you for your goodness we thank you for your blessings we thank you for your truths father i thank you for the fellowship of these fine men the messages the specials uh, the, thank you for sending your spirit today thank you for blessing thank you for edifying and now, Lord, thank you for the food and the fellowship we're about to receive. You truly are benevolent and good. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Come on down and eat and get to know each other.